and is the William E. Rather Distinguished Service Professor in the Departments of Astrophysics and Physics and the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago. Dr. Suzette McKinney is the CEO and Executive Director of the Illinois Medical District and is currently serving as the operations lead for the state of Illinois COVID-19 alternate care facilities and is a member of the Science and Security Board. Today, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists leaves the doomsday clock unchanged. It is 100 seconds to midnight. Before we continue, please note that a link to the doomsday clock report, news release, photos, and video can now be found in the chat area of your Zoom dashboard. The next speaker is Dr. Asha George, Science and Security Board member, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and Executive Director, Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. Thank you, thanks so much. And thank you, Rachel, for your leadership of the bulletin. Um, despite the word atomic in its name, as you saw in the opening film today, uh, today is not the first time that the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has addressed the biological threat. <clears throat> Articles and previous clock statements have addressed naturally occurring diseases as well as biological attacks and with good reason. Before COVID-19 began spreading around the world, the idea of a devastating pandemic was relegated mostly to science fiction, Hollywood movies, and historical references. I think we all know now that that is not the case, and it never was. As expected, COVID-19 is not receding. It isn't behaving the way we wish it would. It didn't just blow through the world's populations and then fade away. It spread, and because we didn't or we couldn't, control it, it mutated and produced at least four more infectious and possibly more deadly variants. And as we continue to draw down on masks, wear out our public health workforce, our healthcare deliverers and our first responders, and we wait for industry to manufacture and distribute vaccine, the threat of biological attack only increases. And it's increasing at the same rate or even a greater rate possibly than, than the rate at which technology, biotechnology is advancing throughout the world. This disease has revealed our vulnerabilities in ways that none have before, not even pandemic influenza and the anthrax attacks of 2001. Taking this into account, we have the same opportunity that the founders of the bulletin wanted for atomic scientists uh, to inform the public. By taking the impact of COVID-19 and other biological threats into account when setting the doomsday clock, we are working to ensure that the world is aware of the great possibilities and potentially devastating consequences of biological science and technology. As we can see with the current pandemic, Something as small as a viral mutation could push us closer to doomsday. A, a viral mutation that could occur in an instant. We must continue to take this threat seriously, even when COVID-19 is well behind us. In closing, I would just say that I am often asked how I compare dissimilar threats and how I dare to compare biological devastation with nuclear winter, with climate change, and so on. And this is how I answer. I dare, and the bulletin dares, to talk about the biological threat, quite frankly, because more than 100 million world people worldwide have become ill with this disease, and more than 2 million people have died from it. The pandemic has not yet ended. We have every responsibility and requirement to continue to bring this threat and to continue to highlight the potential uh, benefits and horrible consequences of unrestrained biotechnology. I hope that we do more than just look at the clock and issue a few uh, media reports and get on with our day. I hope that we take this information and we act, act to bring those, those hands back further and further and make the world a safer place. Thank you. Again, that was Dr. Asha George, Science and Security Board member, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and Executive Director, Bipartisan Commission on Biodefense. Let's proceed to our next speaker, Dr. Susan Solomon, Science and Security Board member, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and Lee and Geraldine Martin, Professor of Environmental Studies at MIT. 
Thank you. It's a pleasure to have the chance to talk with you today uh, regarding climate change issues in the doomsday clock. And I also will start with a few words about the pandemic. As uh, COVID-19 hit in the first part of 2020, carbon dioxide emissions globally did drop by about 17% compared to last year, but then they've largely bounced back. And the full year change is only some four to 7% lower than last year. The emissions are expected to increase as the world emerges from the pandemic, unless we take very deliberate policy steps. We need to reduce fossil fuel use and the emissions of other greenhouse gases. And of course, disease-induced changes in emissions are nobody's idea of a desirable future, nor are they sustainable. So while this is bad news, there's also some good news. Renewable energy has been more resilient than fossil during the pandemic because once installed, renewable sources have nearly no operating source costs. And that shows how useful they can be in turbulent times like this. In the United States, coal has proven to be unable to compete with the low cost of natural gas and renewables. And coal is projected to provide less electricity than renewables this year for the first time. Globally, the demand for fossil power has declined while demand for renewables has risen. Meanwhile, the world witnessed several of the signatures of a warming planet 2020. Overall, the global average temperature was essentially tied with 2016 for the title of warmest year in the instrumental record going all the way back to 1880. And carbon dioxide concentrations kept going up as they will continue to do until we bring, bring anthropogenic emissions down to near zero. We also continue to see concerning changes, <coughs> excuse me, in the frequencies of several types of extreme events that have been attributed to climate change. Much of Western North America and part of Australia suffered massive wildfires in 2020, even in remote areas where the forests are unmanaged. Fires in climatically dry places became bigger and fire seasons lasted longer, in large part because of faster evaporation in a warming world. And another signal of human-caused climate change has emerged in heavier rainfall in hurricanes and typhoons, as well as evidence that uh, sea level rise is accelerating. So next I'll talk a little bit about COVID-19 stimulus efforts in climate change, the trillions of dollars in the stimulus programs that countries have launched so far are generally not particularly green. A lot of fossil-based stimul stimulus is, uh, is, is planned. So at present, the um, national plans for fossil fuel development and production are not that encouraging. Um, they project a global growth in carbon dioxide emission from fossil fuel use of roughly 2% per year over this coming decade, which is a critical time. Emissions would need to decline precipitously if the temperature commitments of the Paris Agreement are going to be met. So the picture is basically mixed. There's a great deal of concerning news about how the climate is changing already and how the world has responded. But the election of, a, of an American president who acknowledges climate change as a profound threat and supports international cooperation and science-based policy puts the world on a much better footing to address global problems. The US has already announced that it's rejoining the Paris Agreement on climate change and the mechanics of that should be complete in a month or so. Next, the US and other countries should accelerate commission commitments to decarbonize and put policies in place that make the attainment of those commitments feasible. Fundamentally, I would say that we're at a crossroads. Um, we're at a very dangerous crossroads and it's the choices that are just about to come that will determine our path. Thank you. Again, that was Dr. Susan Solomon, Science and Security Board member, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and Lee and Geraldine Martin, Professor of Environmental Studies, MIT. Let's go to our next speaker, Dr. Steve Fetter, Science and Security Board member, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and Professor of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. Thank you. The risks posed by nuclear weapons remain unacceptably high and increased in 2020. The United States is modernizing its entire nuclear arsenal at a cost of more than a trillion dollars, which will allow it to maintain a large and alert force through nearly the end of this century. Russia also is modernizing its nuclear force 
including the development of several new weapon systems in response to, to the deployment of US ballistic missile defenses. The US and Russia continue to deploy in peacetime nearly a thousand nuclear weapons that can be launched in minutes. Both are developing or deploying intermediate range missiles that previously were banned. And Russia still maintains thousands of tactical nuclear weapons, raising the prospect that a conventional conflict could escalate to nuclear war. China is modernizing and expanding its nuclear force. In the United States, Russia and China are racing to develop a new generation of hypersonic weapons. India, Pakistan, and North Korea continue the steady expansion of their nuclear forces. Several countries are developing delivery platforms that can carry either nuclear or conventional warheads, increasing the dangers of miscalculation during a crisis. Mm. Arms control and other diplomatic efforts to reduce risks stalled in 2020. These included unrealistic US demands to Russia and China, coupled with threats to launch and win a new nuclear arms race. No progress in negotiations with North Korea and a maximum pressure campaign against Iran that only served to accelerate its uranium enrichment. Previous cooperation on the security of nuclear materials has lapsed and there are no serious efforts aimed at limiting deployments, uh, developments of cyber weapons, space weapons, missile defenses, and hypersonic missiles. And if that were not enough reason for concern, the events at the US Capitol three weeks ago highlighted the danger of vesting in one person the sole authority to order the use of nuclear weapons, leading the Speaker of the House to take the remarkable step of contacting the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs to ensure that an unhinged president could not start a nuclear war. At the same time, there are indications that significant progress in reducing nuclear risks is possible in 2021. The United States and Russia just announced their intention to extend for five years the New START Treaty and to explore discussions on a range of arms control and security issues. President Biden has indicated his desire to rejoin the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, and Iranian President Rouhani has indicated his willingness to return to full compliance in exchange. The upcoming review of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, which was postponed due to the pandemic, will give the Biden administration and the other nuclear weapon states an opportunity to demonstrate their commitment to reduced reliance on nuclear weapons. One way to do this is to commit to no first use. There are indications the US may do so. As Vice President Biden said, there was no scenario in which the first use of nuclear weapons by the United States would make sense. And his campaign stated that the sole purpose of the US nuclear arsenal should be to deter nuclear attack. We hope President Biden will take this important step. Thank you. Again, that was Dr. Steve Fetter, Science and Security Board member, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and Professor of Public Policy, University of Maryland. Let's go to our next speaker, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, co-chair the World Health Organization Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, Nobel Peace Prize recipient, former president of Liberia and member of the elders. Thank you. Excellencies, chair officers and members of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to join you today for the 2021 unveiling of the Domesday Clock. I'm sorry that we cannot all be there in person, but the continuing disruption and devastation to humanity caused by COVID-19 is a timely reminder to take seriously all the threats identified by the Doomsday Clock. COVID-19 has turned the world upside down in 2020. Today, we have the opportunity for a global reset to admit and learn from past mistakes and better prepare ourselves for the future threats, whether they may be from nuclear confrontation, climate disaster, fresh pandemics, or a mixture of all of these. President Biden's decisions 
to rejoin the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and once again, be a full member of the World Health Organization are welcome steps in the right direction. I'm encouraged by his decision to seek an extension to the New START nuclear arms agreement with Russia and hope that he will also prioritize the need to work for a successful outcome at the forthcoming Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. Today, a new mood prevails in Washington with American diplomats once again working in support of the multilateral system that their country did so much to create following the Second World War. This is good but it is not enough. Even after 2 million deaths and unprecedented economic turmoil, global leaders are still not working together at an appropriate scale and speed to coordinate their response to COVID-19 and ensure an equitable distribution of vaccines nor are they showing the necessary ambition on climate change less than a year before the critical COP26 summit in Glasgow. And the scale of activity, or rather inactivity, on nuclear arms control and disarmament negotiations could lead one to assume a problem has long been resolved rather than facing its worst crisis since the height of the Cold War. That being said, the entry into force last week of the Treaty on the Pro Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons underlines the fact that the majority of countries around the world support a comprehensive ban on all nuclear weapons. The nuclear armed states must recognize that their global credibility will be seriously undermined so long as they fail to make tangible progress towards disarmament or nuclear threat reduction. Failure to recognize this reality threatens progress and undermines the existing non-proliferation and disarmament architecture. As the pandemic has made clear, we can only survive and thrive if we work together. Inevitably, Today's crisis takes me back to 2014 when I was serving as president of Liberia and the Ebola outbreak in West Africa reached its peak. At that time, the world responded with mass mobilization and thanks to the efforts of neighboring countries, the UN the WHO and the United States, we were able to stop the spread of Ebola before it became a global pandemic. We can only speculate where the world would be if similar global resolve and solidarity had not been shown 12 months ago but anger at past missteps must now be channeled into a fierce determination to build a better world in 2021, fostering a new spirit of multilateral cooperation that is aligned with the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the Sustainable Development Goals. 
One year ago, my fellow elders, Mary Robinson and Banky Moon, moved the hands of the doomsday clock to 100 seconds to midnight. Today, these hands are still. But that doesn't mean the ex existential threat we have faced remain immobile. What we have all endured over the past year shows that we cannot afford to waste any more time. Future generations will neither understand nor forgive for the inaction in the face of such grave threats. Thank you. Again, that was Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, co-chair, World Health Organization Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response, Nobel Peace Prize recipient, former president of Liberia, and member of the elders. Let's go to our second to last speaker, Hidehiko Yuzaki, governor of Hiroshima Prefecture, Japan, who joins us by pre-recorded video because of the early hours right now in uh, Japan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hirohiko Yuzaki, Governor of Hiroshima Prefecture. It's my great pleasure to have this opportunity to deliver a few words to you all today. On this occasion, I'd like to express my deep respect to President Rachel Branson, member of the Bolton of Atomic Scientists, and all the distinguished guests at this event for their efforts to cultivate the minds of people through this publication. The Bolton indeed plays an important strategic role in illustrating grave scientific and technological matters that threaten human society, including the challenges of nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction, as well as global climate change. Despite nuclear evolution being the long-awaited wish of all A-bomb survivors, there's still more than 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world, with nuclear states continuing to modernize their nuclear forces. Moreover, nuclear disarmament continues to stagnate, further exacerbating global tensions. This is evident through the lapse of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the United States unilateral withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal, and Iran suspending its cooperation in several JCPOA requirements. Under these circumstances, to encourage both nuclear and non-nuclear states to promote nuclear abortion with more urgency, I believe it is essential to discredit the enigmatic nuclear deterrence theory, the primary rationale for reliance on nuclear weapons. To this end, Hiroshima Prefecture has been collaborating with peace research institutions worldwide, such as the CIPRI and Chapman House. From our research, we have concluded that nuclear deterrence theory has significant fixed defects in the four following aspects. First, the nuclear deterrence theory is based on the assumption that states are rational entities whose decision makers make fully informed and logical choices. The second, given the currently unstable relationships between the United States and its allies, the effectiveness of extended nuclear deterrence is very uncertain. Third, the influence new technologies will have on international relations is unknown, particularly the vulnerability of defense systems to new weapons, such as hypersonic wide vehicles. And fourth, the development of low-yield nuclear weapons has blurred the boundary between conventional weapons and nuclear weapons. In other words, the nuclear deterrent theory is based on unverifiable assumptions with technological innovation and geopolitical factors further bringing into question whether deterrence will continue to prevent nuclear war. In these circumstances, we must never allow ourselves to stop thinking critically or to become complacent in our dependency on nuclear deterrent theory. 
The nuclear deterrence theory, that is, the belief that attacks from the enemies are preventable through the position of nuclear weapons, is based on the cognitive framework of human beings, which means it is merely a fiction shared and believed by people. It is not a scientific truth like the law of gravity. The law of gravity does not make mistakes, depend on emotion, or betray expectations, but we humans do. And there is too much evidence and testimony that we did make mistakes, depending on emotions and betraying expectations on the verge of nuclear attack, for us to continue relying on our lives and the future of this planet on this theory. Unfortunately, since nuclear deterrent theory is a man-made fiction, it will lose its power if everybody stops believing it. The national security system relying upon nuclear weapons can be changed because nuclear deterrent theory is nothing more than a common myth, no matter how solid it may appear. The disarmament agenda drawn up by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres comprehensively describes the disarmament challenges that international society faces today, including those regarding nuclear weapons. In order to stately fulfill this agenda, it is necessary to facilitate discussions involving all UN member states, international organizations, and NGOs. Since every human on Earth is a stakeholder in this enduring issue, we need to generate powerful momentum towards the abolition of nuclear weapons by networking and invoking the engagement of as many people as possible. Hiroshima will strive to help all UN member states agree to eliminate nuclear weapons as soon as possible and set their abolishment as a new target. In order to delegitimize the nuclear deterrence theory and realize nuclear abolition as soon as possible, at least in the lifetime of A-bomb survivors, we must remember Pope Francis' word during his address in Hiroshima. He asserted that it is essential that we collect wisdom from all over the world and take collective actions involving all people and all countries. So let us share wisdom and take actions now before future generations blame us for inaction and irresponsibility. Thank you. Again, that was Hidehiko Yazaki, governor of Hiroshima Prefecture in Japan. We'll now turn to concluding remarks from our seventh and final speaker, Governor Jerry Brown, Executive Chair, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and former governor of the state of California. Thank you. Uh, my statement is very brief. It's as follows. The United States, Russia, and the world's nuclear powers must stop shouting at each other. It's time to eliminate nuclear weapons, not build more of them. Likewise, with climate change, the United States, China, and the other big countries must get serious about cutting lethal carbon emissions. Now, not tomorrow. It's 100 seconds to midnight. Wake up. Look, when it comes to nuclear danger, it's real. The planetary people, humanity, is at stake at risk. The United States and Russia are yelling at each other because they're very different. America thinks Russia is doing a lot of bad things, and they may well be. Russia has their own objections to America. Not to, saying they're equivalent, but in the face of nuclear holocaust, they are much smaller than the challenge of reducing nuclear danger. When it comes to climate, the China and the United States are the major polluters and also the major authors of the turn that we could make to reduce and eventually eliminate carbon emissions. The time is late. We're 100 seconds from doomsday. It is time to change. It's time to rise above the news of the day and the political issues that are so important in Washington, Moscow, and Beijing. It's time to get real and stop building nuclear weapons and find a way to eliminate them throughout the entire world. Thank you. Again, that was Governor Jerry Brown, Executive Chair, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and former governor, of the state of California. That takes us to the Q&A portion of the call. If you wish to ask a question, use the raise your hand function and your line will be unmuted when it's your turn to ask a question. As a reminder, these are audio questions only. You will not be on camera. 
The Q&A period is for reporters only. If you're having issues with your own audio or the raise your hand function, you may use the text-based Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to all the questions. Before we go to our first question, we'd like to remind you that a link to the Doomsday Clock report, news release, photos, and video is now available in the chat area of your Zoom dashboard. Alternatively, you can go to thebulletin.org to find all the materials related to today's announcement. Okay. Our first question comes from Michael Del Castillo, Forbes. Hi, yeah, thank you for the chance to ask my question. Um, I, I'm curious uh, what, and it's an open question to everybody, um, what action should regular citizens take to ensure that the bulletin's decision to keep the clock closer to midnight than it has ever been is considered by the governments and businesses that serve them? Uh, many of you addressed uh, some past frustration with the inaction um, to the decision to move the hands of the clock. And I'm curious, what could people like my mom and dad and my sister and my wife and I do to ensure that people are paying attention and take action on this? I can answer that question, uh, if I may. Uh, speaking as someone who's been in the political world for over 50 years, uh, look, there's not a lot the individual can do alone. Uh, the most important thing is to make sure that every one of your political representatives know that nuclear is an extreme danger now. The same can be said about climate change, although there is more time for that particular threat. We're in deep trouble. Uh, the average person only knows what's in the news. The news systematically understates or conceals the nuclear danger we're now in. We get more news about climate but not enough to cause action. So there's the dilemma. The politicians are asleep. The people are unable to make decisions on their own <clears throat> other than to influence whatever politicians they encounter. <clears throat> Mike. Michael, okay. this is, Ra this is Rachel. Oh. Let me just jump in on that and thank you so much. I think in, in the, pan the pandemic has helped us lead the way where we've been able to see how individual action when rolled up in the way that the governor suggests, uh, how powerful it can be. The role of wearing masks are an individual decision. The role of staying at home as we all are, are individual decisions. That individual decisions when aggregated can make a huge and powerful difference to keeping political intention on key issues. Climate and nuclear have their own ways of responding and the climate community has done a better job of finding ways that individuals can take action. And we do see a bright spot uh, around the world of young leaders taking up climate action to keep the pressure on individual leaders. It's harder on nuclear issues, but as the governor said, asking representatives regularly can make a big difference. But we've also seen the power of the, the ban treaty, the Treaty on the Prevention of Nuclear Weapons that has forced leaders around the world to take up these issues. How we roll that up into action becomes uh, the key question. But I think there are examples on all three of these issues that individual action when aggregated can make a powerful difference. So we're really appreciative of that question. Great. Before we go to our next question, we want to remind reporters on the line uh, that if they wish to ask a question to use the raise your hand function. Good to get your question in while we have all of our speakers together at once. And just as a reminder, the Q&A period is for reporters only. And if you're having any issues with your audio or the raise your hand function, you may use the text based Q&A box and we'll do our best to get to all the questions. So our next question comes from Molly McHugh at Great Power. and please make sure to enable your own audio. Hi, everyone, sorry, sorry about the technology issues. Um, <laughs> thank you for taking the question. Um, you know, Dr. Bronson mentioned in her opening comments, um, this issue of sort of uh, disinformation and conspiracies and the overall erosion of uh, fact-based scientific truth. 
Um, but I didn't really see this reflected in, in um, the other issues that were raised. And I wonder when you're looking at the overall analysis and calculation of the doomsday clock writ large, how much this is becoming a factor in how we evaluate the threats that are presented against us as uh, societies, as nations, and as a collective species. Um, when we see how much uh, the tools and tactics of disinformation, of radicalization, of building extremist cultures and mindsets is um, finding a real home across technology-based platforms on the internet. Um, and that's not just an American problem. It's not just one small political event. This is something that's happening around the world. It's a tool of uh, sort of data-driven technology-enabled authoritarianism that the Chinese and the Russians and others are offering to African nations and more as sort of tools of oppression and, and oppression of dissent. And I wonder if this is something that you're considering when you look holistically at um, the threats that we face as a species, our ability to determine what are the threats against us if we can't see and evaluate truth in the same way anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. I, I might turn this over. Susan and Asha, do, would you like to talk about how misinformation and disinformation are used in the climate space and the public health space? And Madam President, I, I wonder whether you could talk a, a bit about the challenges at the leadership level of, of social media and what that means in terms of, of the information flow and the different challenges for leadership. Susan or Asha, could I start with you? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think we can all see we're all very familiar with what happened here in the United States with misinformation and disinformation about the disease, about what, what to do to protect yourself from the disease, about the potential treatments for the disease, uh, and so forth. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, when you have this, this, this maelstrom of misinformation and disinformation, it does make it incredibly hard to accurately evaluate uh, the risk that you're, that you're talking about, certainly in the biological space and in the public health space. Um, but that doesn't mean that it is an impossible thing to do. It just means that you really have to take that extra step to evaluate the information that you do have that, that is coming at you. Um, make sure that it's, it's valid, make sure that it's reliable, and then utilize that information to, to uh, determine the risk. Um, that's one thing I would say. The other thing I would say too is that this is where we're at. Knowing this it, and knowing that it's threat agnostic, uh, we need to start taking some action and uh, some, some forward action to address disinformation and misinformation. Um, we have to figure out a way to identify it more quickly so that all of the information coming at people is not evaluated as, as exactly the same thing as all truth or all, all falsehood. Susan, do you have thoughts on the climate space? The climate scientists in many ways were canaries in the coal mine on this one. Yeah. Um... One of the real difficulties communicating climate change to, uh, to people in a disinformation world is that climate change causes different impacts in different parts of the world. So one place may be suffering from increased drought where another place is suffering from uh, increased heavy rainfall. But I actually think people are, are, are starting to get that now. Um, and in a related sense, one of the things that I think makes climate change so challenging is that the phenomena that we're talking about are, are not new phenomena. You know, COVID-19 was new. So, you know, we, 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 we fear greatly things that are new and unknown. But in the sense that we've seen uh, droughts before, people have difficulty understanding the idea that, hey, they're happening more often and they are more severe and they're happening simultaneously in more different places in the world. But I, again, I really think that the signal is beginning to emerge from the noise. Even though these are familiar phenomena, they are, the, the extremes are getting so much worse than they used to be that people are starting to, to, to really pay attention. So I'm, I'm optimistic that, I mean, it's sad that we had to get to the point where the, the signal was so big compared to the noise of variability. 
But unfortunately, I would say the last couple of years we are there. And this year in particular was a dramatic year, as I indicated. Madam President, in, in the bulletin statement, we refer to um, this as a threat multiplier, that the, the noise in the system, the inability to communicate, the, um, the untruths and mistruths um, become a threat multiplier and making it difficult to deal with all of these major challenges. Uh, the infodemic as that Asha was referring to. And she used the term that um, this misinformation is threat agnostic, which I think is a terrific term. How do you see this at the leadership level of managing the greatest challenges that we face? Oh, Madam President, you're on mute. Okay, today we live in a world of technology where we run a real risk of who we are, what we do can be defined by social media. There are too often that information is sought from sources that are not evidence-based that are not justified by data. And that puts a leader in a difficult position of trying to ensure that truths prevail, that policies are not affected by information that is based, about disinformation that gets carried by the media, gets carried by entities, is repeated sometimes, and repeated so many times that it perceived to be facts. Uh, and so one, as a leader, one is always mindful of ensuring good communication with the people. That one on a regular basis, uh, find a way to tell the truth. And in pandemics, you could be having a dangerous situation where false information, misinformation, misunderstood information becomes a topic of discussion and thereby destroy the confidence of the public in the leader and in the different measures that are being taken to address a, a pandemic or to solve a particular problem. Um, we cannot perhaps go too far in regulating the media, because that would mean undermining information which is necessary for every society. But we must find a way and each, and each leader must find a way in his own environment is how we can ensure that uh, we tell the truth, uh, we, we challenge where untruths are being spread that will create uh, that will create problems in carrying out our development goals. It's a real problem. And today I'm listening at things that are happening in the UK about this information and how, what measure they will be taken uh, to ensure that uh, we do require that those who that are going to carry information has the responsibility to ensure that that information is the truth. Great. Let's go to our next question. It's from Tom O'Connor at Newsweek. Please make sure to enable your audio. Go ahead, Tom. Hi, Tom O'Connor from Newsweek here. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, my question, thank you very much for having me first. Um, my question is, um, over the past year, because of the role it's played uh, in retreating from climate uh, agreements, nuclear treaties, JCPOA, and uh, and walk away from New START, INF, also the approach it's had to the WHO, of course, throughout the, the, the pandemic and current state event of the pandemic it's in right now, um, would you say the U.S. has played a unique role, perhaps a, the most influential one in pushing the clock to 100 seconds in the first place. And now, of course, keeping it at 100 seconds. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Steve, do you want to begin to try to address that question? And I will be happy to backstop if needed. 
Yes, I, I would say that the U.S. has played a major role in increasing uh, the, the risks to humanity. And not just in the areas that you cite in nuclear weapons and in climate change, but perhaps even more prominently in the erosion of the information uh, ecosystem that the U.S. president, uh, sadly, has been a, a major uh, distributor of false information, not just in these areas and, and in the pandemic, but in many others, and has led to a, a really dramatic erosion of public confidence in the capacity of government, uh, in the, um, uh, uh, the, the ability of government to tell the truth uh, to its citizens and provide accurate information and uh, and uh, a roadmap to action to deal with the risks. So I, I, I think that is perhaps the most significant negative role that the United States has played over the last four years. Governor Brown, uh, did you want to jump in on that? I do, because uh, look, just contrast what Ronald Reagan said with Gorbachev about a nuclear war must never be fought. Uh, contrast uh, wh where we are today with John Kennedy, who in his speech at American University called upon the Soviet Union, uh, Khrushchev, to work with America uh, to, to stop uh, nuclear testing in the atmosphere. The tone today is very different. In Washington today, uh, the emphasis on Russia's uh, misdeeds is very, very powerful. Uh, and I don't want to argue uh, the, the weight of all those misdeeds. I just want to say they're infinitesimal compared to the Holocaust uh, of a nuclear blunder. Uh, the same with China. Yes, they have very serious issues and, and problems, misdeeds, but compared to the devastation of climate change, uh, they're small. So yes, these other countries are responsible, but America could do so much more and it's not taking it seriously. I speak as, a, as someone who's been around politicians. I know the people in charge. I've met them. Uh, they're, they, they know this stuff, but they're not willing to tell the American people the danger that 100 seconds to midnight entails. So uh, yes, we are contributing. We're, we're acting as though we are the good and they are the bad. And yet we know we are right in the middle of a nuclear escalation through the modernization program of this trillion dollar plus program. So yes, uh, Russia is doing bad, China doing bad, but America, who we are a part of, could do so much better. And we're not doing all that we could because the president and the congressional well, leaders are not honestly saying the danger, the danger that we are now in. Excellent. Well, we're running short on time. I think we have time for maybe one final question, and we'll take one out of the Q&A box. This one is from Maria Kramer at the New York Times. She writes, can you explain your methodology? How much time do you spend together discussing what the biggest threats to humanity are, and what data do you look at? Thank you. Maybe I'll take that last question. Maria, thank you for your question. Science and Security Board comes together twice a year. To, um, to look through the, the um, to look through their statements from the past years and to assess what challenges uh, stand before us. Throughout the year, they're preparing um, briefing papers and are engaged with how we want to present the threats and how what are the judgment is of how uh, safe or at risk humanity is this year compared to last year and this year compared to the 75 years that we asked that question. So they come together twice a year. They decide the time in November at a November meeting in Chicago. Between November and today, they're in active conversations about their decision, whether it has changed given uh, the events that we're seeing, how they wanna position it for the report in the final report we released today. So as you can see in front of you today is uh, select members of our science and security board who are working on their particular issues every single day and they come together 
twice a year. And the bulletin is publishing on these issues multiple times a day. So the challenge we set before them is incredibly difficult. And what we're asking them is to strip through the nuance and come up with a very blunt answer to the question, is humanity safer or at greater risk this year compared to last year? And how does that fit into the nearly 75 years we've been talking about this? And so they assess their data, they assess what they worked on to come up with a collective judgment. In many ways, very much putting together apples and oranges. And I think you'll see from some of them, it is not easy to do that. But at the end, it's, ask, it's answering a very simple question and to take everything they do to put it together to say, should we move the hands back, forward or stay the same? That is, is humanity at greater risk, less risk or has it remained the same? And this year at setting the clock at 100 seconds to midnight, the collective wisdom of our group is that it's a wildly dangerous time with some incredibly important bright spots. And so we're take, we will wait to see with the hope that these bright spots can be expanded. And those are articulated in our report that's on our website. So that next year, as always, we hope to move the hands of the doomsday clock away from midnight. Great. We are running out of time. We do want to make sure that everyone knows where to get more information following today's news conference. If you need to connect with any of the speakers that you heard from today or just get more information, you can contact Alex Frank, 703-276-3264. And that's 703-276-3264. We know some reporters prefer to take their questions and interviews offline. And as a reminder, our recording of this news event and the related uh, media materials will be available online at thebulletin.org. We thank you all for joining this news event sponsored by the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. That concludes today's news event. Thank you.